All right, so today we got uh, Trayvon Hall from Enhance You. How are you, Trayvon? How are you? Hey, I'm doing good, man. Doing good. Luis, how are we doing, man? Good, good. So thank you again for joining me uh, as a guest on the Conversation Podcast. Again, we're just uh, bringing you raw and, and unfiltered conversations. And today we're, uh, I'm excited to talk to you because I know that you're, uh, you're a hard charger go-getter in the uh, sports performance arena. Uh, so how about we introduce yourself and who you are and what Enhance You does, my friend? Hey, so, man, I'm Tremaine Hall, and we the uh, owner of Enhance You Sports Performance Academy. And we, we train, uh, I would like to say we train athletes uh, for the simple fact of the matter to be better athletes and better yet, be better people. You know, that is our motto. And that's what we we, we, uh, we definitely drive towards. And also, we live we live by these three things, you know, faith, focus, and finish. You know, is the thing we drive to all athletes as well. But we train athletes from, from youth to the pros, right? We, we, we have so many different levels that we approach on. But that's been the, the, the focus of NHU development. It's not necessarily, in today's world, in, 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 in the sports forms, when you hear people have systems and all those things, we believe in developing somebody, you know, that overall person, each and every day that can be a better person in our community, you know, right? and, and just uh, being a better athlete on the field. You know, so it, that's, that's the biggest thing for us. And, and, and the, the whole background of it in 2000. 2009, small high school weight room. Everybody has that, that ultimate dream of being uh, one day a large facility. Um, yeah. So I started there, and I started that coming out when I, I played in the NFL for five years, you know, Tennessee Titans and the New Orleans Saints. And I it came back and, and, and got along with the sports performance piece. And that part has been something uh, that was always inside of me, training, you know. But when you start learning your body with exercise science and, and honing a degree of it and those things, so you start learning the different your different crafts and what the body needs to to not just energize itself, but to push out and be most productive. You know what I mean? So um, from from a sports performance standpoint, so that's kind of the, that background. We started there at Wayne High School. It was like a little box hole in the wall there, as they, they say, and and a dream flourished when we picked up Braxton Miller. You know, got to start training him in, at sophomore in high school. And all of a sudden, you know, he, he was already an athletic guy. But after that, he, be, he became a, a stronger, more fit guy, you know. And, and, and after that point, it's just a national rank started happening in our, in our company, you know. It started building. It started building itself. And while we were in high school, it wasn't in hand you. It was just basically going in. I was just training. And you just kind of – and after that point, it was uh, – uh, for uh, one local was a, a doctor assistant in – two other high school coaches and, and myself, we sat down at the restaurant at Frickers, you know, and I remember the day we'd done it. And, uh, and we sat down and, and they had the aspiration of a, saying, hey, we need to start something and we can call it, you know, one of the coaches while I came up with the name in and we were all agree, agreed upon it. But, you know, when we left the table, I was the last man standing, you know? Yeah. And I took something, I believe, man, and, and, and I punched at it. And punched that over, over, going over 10 plus years now to the point that we're the only, you know, I mean, us in another uh, facility in the Miami Valley signed a five year deal with Premier Health Network, you know. And I mean, that hospital, one of the, one of the largest hospitals in Ohio, you know. So that, that's something to have to sign that partnership was something big and thinking about where we started from. So just a little bit of background about, about Enhance You, and, you know, so and, and, and its culture. So I'm assuming that it does, it didn't just start in 2009. You you must have you said you you were playing in the NFL for five years. So right. So before before you actually sat down in, in that dinner table, uh, and and had that that dinner, like you said, you were the last man standing with that idea of that dream, and now you're 10 years strong. Right. Take me back a little bit where you came from because I, I think I did some uh, some research on you, and I think there's something that you and I shared where I found pretty interesting. There was an article that I read that you were in Florida. And uh, uh-huh. uh, and you moved up to Ohio. You you're pushing because you said I need to go up to Ohio. Um, but then uh, the people in your circle, your inner circle, saw that talent that you have. But then people uh, outside of your circle, they they were pulling you. The outside forces were pulling you to uh, potentially bad things, right? But you decided, hey, now you went to this youth. You went to this youth. Uh, uh, I think it was a, a penitentiary or. Uh, or just a career center, and you helped out some folks yeah. by playing basketball, and you saw how good you had it. And I'm saying that because right. I also grew up. I also grew up in a uh, in a 
interesting neighborhood. Um, and I had those bad influences around me, but at some point, you know, as a young man or a young woman, you have to determine um, what's good and what's bad. If you follow that bad path, you're gonna get, you're gonna actually have all those bad, bad things, take, good things taken away from you. So when I saw that in that article, I was like, you know, that's something that I could, you know, I, I know I share. So walk me back to that journey where you were in Florida and then you, how you migrated into, into your, your football career. I mean, I am, I mean, that, that's, that's, I tell you, that's interesting, man. Growing up in Florida, um, because I, you know, yeah, this is raw and uncut, man. My, my mother had me when she was going on 16 years old, you know, and, uh, we grew up in a neighborhood that wasn't, uh, the most, uh, uh, sound neighborhood. We'd maybe even walk around sometime. Um, but at the same time, you know, she, she had a drive that she installed in her children too, you know, and that's never to give up, you know, never to give up. She had to go back to high school, had to go back to, you know, going to, to get her, some, her, her degree and, and what she's doing now and, and nursing and, and things like that. Um, so, you know, that, that part I respect her on, on totally, but my, my background in Florida, it was, it was very, you know, you had to be, you, your mindset had to be, you had to have the will to win, you know, because uh, many, I see many of my friends, Took the wrong path. They take the wrong path and chose chose to go a different direction than I did. And, and sometimes, you know, you people say, "Well, some people you have you don't have a father figure." You know, I, I did. You know what I mean? And, and I didn't have that. And and, and uh, uh, my mother was remarried, but having a father figure means somebody teaches you things. You know what I mean? Somebody, and, you know, he was a football dad. You know what I mean? He was a football dad. That's what you know. That's he was a football dad. So a lot of things I learned from the streets. You know, one of the things I learned from the streets, um, my uh, will to, to to understand from good and bad, you know, you know, like the local local drug dealer who will try to give, you know, give me money, you know, and when I see say that, like, man, you're going gonna to be a star one day, you know, and, but you got to understand what's behind that and what's, what's behind that. Yeah, that is, there it is. Yep. And that was, that was, that was the bait, you know, and I kind of, you know, much as I, I love candy and, and, and chips and everything else that I feel like this money could have gotten me, you know, so um, <laughs> I was employed with some, some things that thank God with, with, with some wisdom, you know, I mean, at an early age and, you know, his car looked nice, you know, what I mean, his clothes were nice, you know, um, but a lot of our kids took that, a lot of my, my friends took that and they became the street pushers themselves. And so uh, I had an uphill battle from there. You know, a lot of people didn't make it out of my, my neighborhood and do those, to do the things that, you know, I was blessed to do and, you know, to, to play in the NFL. But, I mean, I was the kid who would want to stay out and shoot basketball until the streetlights came on. Testing, you know, best testing my mother, you know, to the point where I'd run, be running home. You know what I mean? But I want that kind of work, you know? Yeah, I'd be up in the early in the morning running at the park and, you know what I mean, doing those things because I had that dream in my mind, like, you know, I won't live like this forever, man. Like, I love this. I just love the game. And whatever I want, whatever it took me to get better, I was willing to do that. You know, so um, that was that was pretty much a lot of the difference from the, the neighborhood that I was in. And, you know, drug infested, you know, I mean, the kids, some of the kids I hung out with, parents on drugs, you know, just it's just those things, those pulling factors, you know, um, we we. We did some things. I mean, you. I was with them at times when they stole things, you know. And 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 luckily, you know, you were able to get away. But at the same time, you still could have been caught up, you know, yeah. because you, you were just the community you were in, just the people you were with. So, um, I mean, and, and to walk away from that and go back to that, you know, Florida was was Florida. Florida, and the point that I was in Florida, it set the foundation for me to be able to fight through anything in life. And what know? year was that and, in Florida? What year was that? Man, I, that was, that was, uh, I mean, I grew up there, so that was going on from, from, I mean, since I was a kid to, um, to, uh, you know, being in, a, in the high school, like 2001, I graduated high school, but, uh, it's just, you know, it was that, it was that kind of, that stretch there, mm -hmm. that stretch, and, and that's why you, I, I go along, you respect, you respect where people come from in their background when you, when you had to fight for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And I like, I like asking that question because, uh, you know, I know, I'm sure we're going to talk about your, what you're doing right now and your leadership style, but I think your foundation and how you grew up shapes, who, shapes who you are right now, right? Not just you, but anybody. Um, because Ooh. I think, you know, I, I think that's something that, uh, when I started reading through that, I was like, ah, you know, um, maybe 
is does that help you connect with your your current athletes right now? That if if there's an athlete that that you can see that they are set for stardom, whether that individual, a female or male, they're going to be uh, you know they could go to the to to be a pro athlete or just an amateur, but they have something in them. But deep down inside, you could you I don't know if that helps you connect with the potential issues and problems that they see in in their society right now. Do you see that as a as a positive? I mean that that is that that is very very true. You know, and 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 when you're dealing with the the outside entity of of you know I mean, because we have to be honest in this, not every every not every kid was given a silver spoon. Yeah. You know what I mean? So for us, for us, that is something that you know we 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 deal with and and not to say that every every kid is is given the given not given the opportunity, but when you're dealing with a kid who doesn't know where his next meal coming from, you know, and you were that kid, you get his drive. You know what I mean? You understand his 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 point of attack, why why he's he's here trained at that enhance you, you know. And number one, he either we giving him a, a, a scholarship to come, or better yet, even to the fact that somebody has ventured and, and paid for his opportunity, they see the same thing. So we we take that understanding where he's come from from like myself, you understand how to talk to him, you know, you understand you know what what really helps him move and get motivated, you know, and, and, and that connection, connection mm-hmm. helps that kid fulfill a dream. Mm-hmm. And what I always like to use him, you know what I mean? I love education, Louis, I love it. But when I'm, when I'm talking to these guys, I tell them what the dream feels like. And all of a sudden I see their grades shoot up like a rocket, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, you know, so for, for me, man, that's, that's, you know, the dream is, the dream is where, these kids fall in love with the process. Because you once had that dream. So you know that, yes. that there's definitely challenges there. No, so we were talking about uh, Traymond's background, where he came from and uh, what helps him connect with, with, his, uh, with his athletes right now. Um, so when you, see, when you see somebody that with so much talent and so much potential, you're able to, to, to dig, dig deep down inside and help them out. Um, how, many, how many athletes do you have right now uh, in your current roster? With the uh, with Huber Tip City, uh, Place. I mean, we, we see about about 150 athletes, you know, at that location, and um, you know, which is kind of you know on and off situation with them due to season wise, you know, but also you know, I mean, so and right now, uh, Coach Emily, uh, she she does the spring burrow, and that's a growing process right now. So roughly, man, I mean, throughout the year, man, we we see roughly about 500 athletes, you know, that we can name throughout the year, and then also we get to Right now, we we really stepped in with the high some of the high schools, so we're dealing with high school athletes on a daily basis, 70, 80 athletes at a time, you know, just in the high school itself. So, I mean, we we really get out get to have our hands on a lot of different you know kids that range from a lot of different places. You know, some kids we we get to deal with our, our, our poverty poverty stricken. You know, it, it's just you know that really can't afford us. You know what I mean? But at the same time, we find the find the scholarships and stuff like that for them. You know what? One thing that I like, I love about sports that it it pretty much neutralizes and equalizes the the, the playing field for everybody. You could be somebody with a 4.0 GPO, you could be barely struggling and, and be at a 3.0 or whatnot. Uh, but at the same time, you could also be rich, like you said, right? Uh, some people are are born with with a, with the wherewithal to be able to to live comfortably. Um, and I'm mentioning this because for the past year and a half, I've I've uh, invested a lot a lot of time traveling down to Louisiana uh, with my business. And uh, hmm. if you've been to if you've been to Louisiana, and I'm not talking about uh, New Orleans, my wife would love that. <laughs> Was that New Orleans or is it Louisiana? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm, you know, uh, there's a special place for for New, for New Orleans. But I've you know I've been outside of New Orleans. I've been to uh, to Generate as an example, Iberia Parish, Evangeline Parish, and I'm mentioning these 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 cities, these these parishes, because when you travel deep down into these into Louisiana. You start seeing uh, the have and the have-nots, uh, right? And mm. a, a lot of poverty. But one thing that struck me with working with my clients was that football is huge. Sports, sports in general, is huge in Louisiana. And uh, when when they're training for 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 football or, or track and field, you can see how the la- the the, play, the playing field is just leveled for everybody. So everybody right. just puts puts their all into that. So from a coaching perspective. How do you how do you manage? Do you rather have a student who's at who has a four point GPO, GPA, 
who's used to getting everything correct or, or not used to struggling or having somebody that, that, that maybe uh, not have a 4.0 GPO, GPA and maybe used to struggling. And how do you manage that perspective with an athlete that, 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 that's coachable versus not coachable? I mean, on, on, on that, that approach is, 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 again, like you said, I mean, sports level, levels the field. And, you know, I mean, I've gotten the fortune through the times to deal with guys who, who are going to Ivy League schools and guys mm-hmm. who are just going to, you know, the, the D3 or, or, uh, or NIA schools, you know. So, um, but at the same time, one thing I do un- understand and, and what's never, never, never fails is that each, every last one of them have a dream. Mm-hmm. You know, to be to be very best athlete or best runner on, on no matter what they're doing. So you get to take that that dream and you put them in, in, in this big pot, you know. And guess what? You know, I know that this kid over here who has 4.0, he may understand what I'm saying immediately. You know, so he he understands what we're looking for for the concepts or, or the model of lifting that we want him to do. First, the kid who may be over here, and I want to use a little slower, but the little kid, the kid over here who doesn't who doesn't grasp as quickly. So basically, we get to spend you know, maybe spend a little more a little more time with this kid over here. But they all come together, and and to see them in in, in our facility work together, you know, is is marvelous. You know, because now you got two different different entities. Kid who understands it, 4.0 kid, but guess what he does? He helps the kid who ain't who, who doesn't really get it at time. You know, and if we're not around or whatever that may be. So the, the, the difference of it, I mean, I, I just think that it, it's it's a little different with the understanding piece, but the dream part of it, I mean, it, it's, it's all the same. It's all so, the same. So what does coaching mean to, to each one of you? Starting with, starting with you, Emily, what, what does coaching mean with you? Coaching to me just is a whole different field. Um, I started coaching track and field um, my senior year of college and just seeing um, a kid trust you and buy into what you're teaching them is an unbelievable feeling because now you have this relationship that you haven't had before per se, even if you do have kids or a family, it's just a different feeling. Um, It's a feel of joy because they just trust you and then they want to work better. Right. So it's just an amazing feeling. And that's why I love coaching. I just love giving back um, to maybe those not so fortunate kids who are growing up in a rough area or the kids that do have, you know, all the money. Um, But just seeing them trust you is probably the main key that I really love coaching. How about you, Trayvon? What, what, what do you, what do you think? What's coaching to you? What does it mean to you? I mean, I just, you know, when you look at you, you, you don't like using that word piggyback, right? But she says, <laughs> there you go, right? Piggy, piggyback off you know, of it. Right? She says, I mean, for the, the, allow that kid to look at you and, 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 and to trust you, you know what I mean? I, I, to trust you and in, in the, in the values that you are making to, to him or her. I mean, those are, those are goosebumps. That's exactly, that's what you want, you know? And to me, with that being said, that, that's that's a key thing about being a great, successful coach. You know, you can bring in, not only can you implement, but you draw the trust of these of these youth. Because I found something out now. Kids don't mind telling you the truth. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so without naming names, have you had bad coaches in, in, throughout your experience and journey as a as a as a as an athlete? Good oh, coaches, yeah. bad coaches. So you know what you know what bad coaching looks like. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, I, so why? I, I'm interested. Can you dive into that? Well, you, immediately, as as I'm asking the question, I can see I'm reading your body language. And you're like, oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, Emily's laughing too because she understands. You know what I mean? It, it, it's to me that that is it's that kind of coach, man. Like you know, you know. I mean, I'm a I'm a I'm a raw raw guy, you know. But at the same time, I know my stuff, you know. And I'm gonna, and not only do I, I can feel like you know, I'm gonna push you, but there's some, there's an objective to why I'm pushing you, you know, or the objective why we're doing what we're doing, versus you know, versus a guy that, that we're gonna lay out something, and all of a sudden, you know, I saw this on YouTube, but there's no end result, you know. Mm, so, mm. so to me, 
So to me, that that that's what that's what really you know when when you talk about bad coaching, we probably see it ninety percent of the time on either social media or YouTube a lot with certain things, you know. So I mean, and it's like taking it's like taking a beginner and having him do uh, uh, jump uh, box uh, box jumps, right? You know, and 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 and, and, and without any technique uh, uh, going beyond when you first start in the box jump, you know, with a simple movement, but really it's not that simple. There's things I have to go along with that. So that's kind of my, my, te- my, my perspective in, in that. And I've had bad coaching in football. You know, I'll be honest, like, you know, a guy who just ain't, uh, don't know, you know, what he's doing, you know, and, and he, he's got the job because a friend of a friend, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, it's one, it's one of those. So, you know, and you know what I mean? And, and my thing is just, that it's just, it comes a whole lot with that in, and only that, uh, or they don't mesh with athletes because they 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 lack the personality or character. You know, they don't they don't they, they don't mesh with them. To me, that is a huge factor. You've got to be able to connect. And you know what I mean? And if you can't you can connect, if you can't connect, then you, you're in trouble. You can use all your book knowledge if you want to, but the whole thing that they don't put in the book and want to be studying is how to connect with an athlete. And it goes back to what you're saying, Louise. How do I connect with the inner city kid, you know, who's probably coming to coming to train and hungry, and we don't know he's fighting through, and he's he's not telling me that he's hungry, but he's not hitting all the reps, and everything else, because there's people over here that spent money for him, and if we, if we and and we are a result driven company, and we're not getting results, why we're we not getting results with him, until he sits us down and says, you know what, I'm not eating. So now we got to be able to connect by going out and being out and be able to purchase from our own money to go get him some Gatorade bars. So when he comes in, you know what I mean, we can get the best the best out of him. So, I mean, it's just it's just little things like that. That's a topic that that's very hot with me, you know. So yeah, no, I know, I know, I, I hear, I hear the passion. <laughs> how about how about you, Emily? Bad coaching. What what the, have you? I'm assuming you have had that bad coaching experience before. If, if you have, <laughs> without naming names, what did, what did that look like? Oh, I've had a, I've had one really bad coach, um, not naming any names and I'm not going to say what grade level it was in, um, sure. <laughs> but man, I had this coach that just beat me down, like on the tr- track, I was just over it. Like I was just that kid, like you pushed me to my limits and I love it, but you pushed me past those or past the capacity that I know I'm not ready for. Yeah. Then I'm done. Right. So like laying on the track and just being like, why am I here? Like, why am I doing this today? Um, but sometimes bad coaching on the other hand teaches us a lot about ourselves and a lot of things that we're willing to do to trust somebody and connect. So it goes back to both those things. Like we want to buy in, but it's so hard to, when you know that they don't know what they're doing and that is very hard. And I think that's something we need to take on as coaches is really connecting and trusting and just being overall a good compassionate coach. So. So you said that bad coaching teaches you a lot of things as a, what do you mean by that? It teaches you as an athlete it teaches you that one you can do more probably than what one the coach is thinking you can or you can't do and two as a coach like going into coaching it teaches you what you would and wouldn't do and how maybe you would advise that situation differently which is really cool for me because I have done that and I'm like Sometimes when you get into that mental state and you slip into coaching, maybe like a way you, you were coached, you're like, no, 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 let's not do that. Let's backtrack, let's rewind, and then just go for like forward from there. So, so what, what, where did your journey start in track and field, and how did it start? You said, oh, well, my dad. I was a really good at soccer when I was younger, and. Okay. One one little thing that I did wrong, my dad would make me run for. Um, and it just, it started with that because it made him so angry that I liked to run. Um, so in seventh grade, I was approached um, 
by the cross country coach and was like, you want to just come out and run for us this year? I was like, yeah, why not? And that's where it all started. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing wow. led to another. That's awesome. Um, you know, the, uh, so I've, uh, I think, uh, like Trey, Trey may have told you, I, I'm also a runner. I don't have a runner's body whatsoever. Uh, but I've, I, I do run. I do love running like yourself. Um, and I realized that kind of one thing leads to another, like we, like we're talking about right now, where there was one time that I started doing, uh, half marathons and I yeah. continued doing half marathons and I wasn't stopping. I just, then I migrated into marathons and I did a marathon after a marathon, like back to back. And one of my buddies was like, dude, you cannot do that. One thing about me that is my fire is that when these, when I hear that word can't, it's like, why can't I, you know, why can't I? And yes. I picked up a and, right, and I picked up a book and I started talking about these crazy people, quote unquote, which I didn't find crazy whatsoever. That were doing ultra marathons. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> so I don't have to do back to back, like meaning like back to back months. I could just do it in all in one shot. And I realized this, this, <laughs> and I realized this because after doing uh, the New York Marathon, uh, New Jersey Marathon, Boston Marathon. I had this dream, kind of like what you were talking about before, Trey, but I had this dream that I could break a, a sub four or three thirty. My body type, and I knew it, I knew it then that by you know that by the fifth or sixth marathon, I was not capable to of, of breaking that, breaking that at all. But I still had the stamina and the, and, and the uh, capability to continue going. Um, and then I started doing ultra marathons. Uh, that kind of just led me. <laughs> Let me to that. So that's kind of what your, your connection right there, where you said that you just loved running. To me, I was just like, ah, oh, you know what? I just, I could keep, I'm like the Energizer Bunny. I could continue going, you know? Um, so one thing that I read too, Traymon, was uh, uh, that a lot of athletes, they seek what you have and what you teach over there. And you mentioned that before, that you, you know your stuff, you know, you know your technique. Can you talk a little bit more about that? What is it that when uh, when athletes uh, seek your your institution and hand to you, what are the things that 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 athletes typically look for uh, to, to to get out of your out of your institution? I mean, from, from that 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 part of it, I think some of the most important part is like you know the skill set, or uh, just on on our end, but you know the, the correct learning of how to do things the right way, you know? That has been a big, big, big return as far as athletes and parents, you know? And again, we never knock anybody from, you know, what they know, you know, especially in high school coaching and things like that. But I mean, it's hard for me to to, to think that uh, that a math teacher, you know, is gonna get in there and, and teach 50 boys how to squat and all those things. You know what I mean? I, just, I mean, I'm just coming from 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 my point. You know that point oh, so, of view. But so you, so you, know you mean me? you mean by by that you mean that uh, in high school or wherever you you may have a, a coach, a gym coach, that may be also right. uh, doing something else, math right. or whatnot. But your focus right. is just purely on on performance. So and oh, you've been there before. Yeah. You've been there yeah, before yes. from your, how you got to uh, to the NFL in the NFL. And then now you're basically teaching folks how to basically be, uh, act. yeah, I see that. I see your point. Yeah, and, and, and that's kind of where we are in the schools now. And with, with the schools, you're like, you know, we're pure sports performance. You know, we teach four periods in uh, a high school now. Just that, that alone. Oh, so you also teach in the high school as well? Yes. So we, we're in the high school with, for four periods from 7 to 1130, you know, teaching sports performance. The lifting and everything else. So basically, they get the PE credit for our school being we are uh, NSU being there, you know. And that was a that was a long dream of, my, of ours, you know. So now we're 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 doing that just that just that alone, you know. So I mean, to me, I think that is where the way to go when you when you been when you're educating people and kids on how to be to train right, how to protect their body right. You know what I'm saying? That you know. So to me, that's kind of the, the, the you're setting the bar for that. You know, and I'm not taking away from anything for us, your teacher and all that, but that's a different atmosphere in there. Yeah. Now let's talk about let, let's let's say let's stay there on the risk management because I think uh, that's really important. Where uh, we're talking about safety, right? We're talking about sports. We're talking about performance. We're talking about uh, you know reaching your maximum. But at the end of the day. You know, if you're if you're not injury free, we 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 don't have anything, right? So, how so from an injury perspective, um, 
have you either you faced any injuries in, in, in your life in your past time in your experience and if so what, what was that uh what was that injury that you had if you if you don't mind talking about it hey, let me go. uh man yeah, whoever uh, whoever whoever my uh my big toe you know you know that that turf you know turf <laughs> toe yeah ah. I thought I never thought an injury would take you out, you know, and, and like, you know, for us, like something like that. But the more I learned by like, you can't function like that big, big toe, you know. So, <laughs> but, you know, it's, I mean, the turf it was painful, man. It was painful, and the position that I played, you know, I needed that a whole lot to cut and move and everything else. I mean, it put me down for mo a month, and every time I tried to tape it and, and get a quarter zone shot in it. I mean, it would just it would just get worse, you know. So the thing I had to do was understand that, that your body, only thing you could do is really go to a therapist who who, who you know who specialize in, in feet and things like that. And and you know, and we were getting I was getting a stretch, but the biggest thing was rest, you know. I used to recover rest. That was the biggest thing. But and that thing had me down, man. And uh and I think a lot of it was kind of my end point, even at New Orleans, you know. So it was it was something that and to the point that it still hurts today, you know. If mm. I can really start getting training, so yeah, I tried doing some research to see what was it that uh, because I, I read something like that and I couldn't find anything. So your toe <laughs> was it your left toe or your right toe? Man, my, my my right toe. And how did that happen? Playing on the playing, practicing, or just yeah. off the field? Yeah, it just, it just planting on the field. Yeah. You know? So I mean, just planting, man, and and. You know what I mean? It just, you know, I believe, I believe over time, really not really taking care of my feet like probably I should have. You know what I mean? I'll be very young. As you get back into it, the science of it, you know, I'm like, this is why it happened. You know, you know, not really not rolling out, rolling out my feet. Like now, man, I roll out my feet every morning. You know what I mean? I <laughs> you know, I don't have to deal with like, you get very cautious. You, it, it, it gets real, man. So, yeah, yeah. you know, not doing the little things that, that you need to do to, to be, to take care of your body and be a better athlete. So speaking about feet, how about you, Emily? I know feet are, are critical for any athlete, but have you ever had any any injuries in the past? Um, yeah, so starting, I come from a very small high school. Um, Carlisle is very, very tiny. Um, I had a wonderful coach. Um, but you know, you're young. Um, I had a young coach. He definitely pushed me. Um, but not to where I needed to be. And so when I went to college, my coach actually increased my mileage by like, it was 25 extra miles a week. Um, and like Tremaine, I did not roll out my feet and I got some really bad plantar fasciitis. Um, and unfortunately, plantar fasciitis is something you as a runner will probably always deal with. Um, so I had to do a lot of rehabbing, um, figuring out what shoe works best for me, and then getting um, an insert into my shoe as well to make running just feel a lot better. Over time, um, you kind of find that you can't wear certain shoes either. Like, um, I wear my Birkenstocks a lot because they actually massage out my plantar fasciitis as a runner, which is really weird, and I'm not telling anybody to go out and buy a $100 pair of shoes just because. What are, what are they called? <laughs> What are they called? They're called Bir um, they're Birkenstocks, um, but they're very firm, and then they have a high arch in them. Um, so somebody had suggested that to me when I was in college, and I was like, "Wow, this made a world of difference." Um, but yeah, so I deal with that on occasion, but not as often as you would think I would deal with it. So yeah. I've never heard of Birkenstock. The, I've seen the sandals, but I, I didn't know they had uh, sneak running sneakers. They don't have the running sneakers. They're just the sandals. But the sandals, like for everyday walking, is really good for runners. Oh, gotcha. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, that <laughs> that makes total sense. I was like, wait, I've seen I've seen the sandals. <laughs> you could totally try to wear them for running, though. That's fine. Uh, you know, <laughs> I I no I I do know that some uh, some tribes down in uh, in Mexico they do they do run in sandals though. But so those injuries, what did what did you guys learn from those injuries from being down? I know the you know the toe 
kind of just uh, you were in the uh, playing for the New Orleans Saints when that happened. Um, and and for yourself, you had the plantar fasciitis. But a lot of people that a lot of individuals that are potentially athletes or non-athletes, once they go through an injury, they just either they do something about it or they or they just let it let it ride, right? And they let it ride, and it just eats at them in their in their in their mind, body, and soul. But it seems like you took a different approach, Dr- Draymond, right? You kind of looked at that as a situation as a, as an opportunity to to potentially help others. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seems that you know you could have easily said, you know what. I'm I'm done with this. I'm not going to even uh, uh, deal with sports any any longer. But for you, I just want to hear your your thought process on that. Once you once that happened, how did that shape your mindset on sports and and what you're doing today? I mean, I mean that was that was a that was a big big part of why you know you wanted to move in this arena, and and also seeing that you know when when I was when I was in high school, I didn't get the things that I think I really needed to be. Um, ready for college, you know? So that part, when I got to college, I was almost playing a catch-up game, a catch-up game again. And then, you know, college, I was a little developed. And then you get to the NFL, then it was also playing a catch-up game. But what I understood from both levels and for through injury and everything else is that it pays to get developed, you know? It pays. And when I say it pays, it's huge. So when I see now, when I got started, it was the point of saying, I'm here to help these guys get developed and understand if you choose to want to go to college or even now, you want to be developed, just you want to play through high school, but be the most developed high, high school player. That's what we're here for, you know? So that was a, that now that was a big drive for us for me. And, and when you, and when you see guys underdeveloped, that's when you begin to see injuries down the road, you know, because those underdeveloped athletes, you know, they think by pushing the heavy weight and everything else is all they need to do, but you're missing the small intri- intricate muscles that make that, that, that make that large muscle move and operate, you know? So, so now, you know, uh, if I make you do a hundred or, or 50 band pull aparts, you know, now we, we're triggering you know, development so we can start moving weight prior to, uh, and we, we, we start moving weight the correct way, you know? So mm-hmm. now we're really helping the development for you to get better. So mm-hmm. that was, I mean, that was, that was a big, big part, man. I mean, huge. And, and, and from our success and the data that we've taken, that kids that come from out of our program that go on to college that first year, five of them became first year starters. Now that same college coach says, man, such and such was, he was ready when he came in. He knew how to, to do the little things in the weight room, in the field. So therefore, to me, that's what speaks volumes to, uh, to, to us as we come into this part and building and building these athletes that come to, that come to us. You know, when he told me that, that's huge. So uh, I want you to, I want you to uh, dive into that development piece a little bit more, um, because I, I, in my mind, when you're talking about it, it brought me back into, uh, I, was, I went to Vermont. And in Vermont, they had a Vermont 100, basically 100 miles in Vermont, right? And I joined this this uh, and I joined this uh, this race, and I knew what I was getting myself into. I knew that I, it was going to be uh, uh, 24 hours. I knew my goal, my personal goal, was to get under 24 hours, 100 miles. And I knew other guy, other females and males, they, they had a, be- a much better uh, uh, objective, getting in uh, into 100 miles in less than what, 15 hours, 16 hours. I know, I know my limitations and I know that I can't do that because that's, like I've mentioned to Emily, I'm not, I'm not a speed demon. I know that for sure. I'm a speed demon for sprints. If I have to go real short distance, but long distance, I know how to pace myself. And I have this mapped out plan just because of all the, all the crap that I've been through before that to me, it was about self-development, right? And when I self-developed myself to be able to uh, perform at this 100 mile race, there came a point that it was like around one o'clock in the morning. And I knew that by looking at the data, I knew that it was going to be extremely hot. Uh, and I saw this one guy, uh, there was a, a big hill um, and this big hill, he was just running up this hill. I decided to walk. I was like, and I kind of stopped him. I said, Hey, <laughs> you know, we have all day, literally you, it's best if you just walk it and then do, uh, then continue sprinting. He said, no, 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 I have to, I have to get in under, uh, I think what he said it was 17 hours, why not? Believe it or not, unfortunately, uh, uh, that sun, that blazing sun turned into night. And I think it was around uh, 11 o'clock uh, at night. It was kind of chilly. 
And I saw this one guy laying on the floor, sitting on the floor, and I just approached him. I was concerned. I was like, hey, man, are you okay? He's, and he was dehydrated. He was waiting for medics to get there. And it was the same exact dude that I, that I spoke to. And he looked at me. He's like, man, I should have slowed down. And I, my heart sunk because I was like, I could either stay here and talk to him and continue, just continue pushing him. But I was like, you know what? He said medics are coming. And I knew medics were coming because they, they go around just to make sure people were right. But the next morning when, when we woke up, I finished the race on the 24 hours. Uh, he did not. He had to uh, DNF, uh, did not finish. But from the self-development, man, that's kind of, it's huge, right? So development, what does that mean for, for you, Emily, and, and also yourself, Draymond? What, because you, you said that that's a driving force because that could also avoid people getting injured, right? Kind of like what I mentioned before with this guy being dehydrated. What does that mean for you uh, from your perspective? Um, for me, personally, um, there's so much I could say on that topic. Um, but <laughs> go, Jesse, go right ahead. You have, to, <laughs> you have to know your limits, right? Um, but you also have to know where you can and cannot push. So for instance, maybe that guy had never pushed himself, right? And now he knows, now he knows I shouldn't have done it, but it was good that you said that because now you know, and that developed you as a runner as well. Um, for me, um, development for myself during that injury, I had to backtrack and really see why I got that. There's always an underlying issue. Like Tremaine had been saying, um, earlier about his turf toe, like there were reasons that led up to that. Right. Um, so my problem was nutrition. Um, I went in a little heavy, like probably 25 pounds that I had not carried ever before in my life. And then, um, I had to backtrack and really see my nutrition and see like how I can change that and develop and be a better runner and so I just think that that's how that helped me and how that developed me now you know nutrition goes really well with running but without without nutrition then I don't really I can't advance in running so that's probably my main key there okay how about yourself Trayvon what does the development mean for you and your approach right now the first thing that I think I approach with a, with a kid is is to build is understanding, you know? And I think a lot of that was missed on my end. Like Emily said, there's a lot of different things that we didn't know, you know, Abby, but if I was, if I was work, or if I had the worth all of it, then the game changes for me. So now I got you to buy into what, what I'm saying. And what I'm saying is over, you know, 20 plus years of failing, failing, failing sometimes as an athlete myself. So you don't have to go this, this route, you know? Yeah. So. Here's the buy-in. So we're we, we're the buy-in and and that mindset. So the mental development has to be developed first. You know, the yeah. mental mindset has to be developed first because this kid can come in and train all he wants, but yet, like Emma said, if he's not eating right or she's not eating right, or or better yet, you're not going coming in and rolling out before you 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 start doing things with us, doing the little things that 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 make you that much better as 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 an athlete, then you haven't really bought into what, we, what we're saying. So mentally, you're out the door, but you want the physical aspect from us. You want us to feed you this, this, this physical aspect of, you know what I mean, how to cut better, all those things. But at the end of the day, I have to have you mentally, you know? When I say that, I have to have you drawn in to say, okay, when I get done doing all the physical aspect, I gotta go back over here and roll these, <laughs> roll these muscles out. <laughs> you know what I mean? That soft tissue. I got to go back and do those things. So if I, when I, when we get guys there and get girls there, I know we're gonna be all right. You know, and I know we really develop in the right way. So it seems that that's part of your leadership strategy as well, right? Because it's, at the yeah. end of the day, as a leader, you need to be able to buy people in based on and, and based on your philosophy, right? So from a leadership yeah. perspective, from a leadership perspective, I know we spoke about good coaching, bad coaching. Uh, sorry, we spoke about back coaching before, but from a leadership perspective, who has been one of those key leaders that you admire in your in your during your experience as a as an athlete? Uh, man, you, you know when you when you talk about like leadership, and, and then to me, it's almost like a, a 
uh, was a, a dying species these days. You know what I mean? What's, what's that? What was that? Leadership? What, what, I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. It's like good leadership is hard to find, man. You know, let's let, let's take a pause. Let's take a pause there. What, what does let's put let's put some definition to that because I know a lot of people. There's a lot of yes. different definitions on leadership, um, and I like where this is going because it's coming. It's coming. It's, I see the genuine approach that you're taking to that to that question. How do how, how do you what definition would you put to leadership? What to me, you know, what I mean when I put the leadership at that point, I I I'm not saying that person is perfect. You know what I mean, but. There, there's things, you know, that definition, he, 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 he or she it is one that carries an integrity and character, you know, that will, that, that beseech them no matter where they are. You, 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 know, you get what I'm saying there? Mm-hmm. And a, a lot of that means a whole lot to me in leadership, you know, because, you know, if, if, if you're a leader and you're saying one thing to me and your character is showing me another, then Come on, you know, and then your integrity showing me another thing. Then that's and then that's hard for me to sit in, sit in your room. You know what I mean? And I'm telling you one thing that the biggest thing is that a lot of times, even 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 out because I, I I love to grow, I love to learn. You know, even when I'm listening and I listen to some people in in in, in our business. You know, and when and and you're up there and you weigh like two eighty five and you're not you know you're not really you know, a workout kind of person or whatever it may be, but I got to close my eyes and listen to your words versus looking at you. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Because what you're speaking ain't, ain't matching, you know? So, you know, and, and sometimes I would be in meetings, I would close my eyes. And people probably thought I was crazy, but I didn't want, to, want my eyes to see the person that was delivering the message because it's something inside me would trigger like, okay, like, does he, is he just a, a person who, who studies or is he, or he, is he a really a believer? And, and what what he's talking about, because to a good leader believes in what he's talking about, and he stands. And guess what? You see the fruit that they put out, you know. So, and that, that so means a whole bunch. So I'm closing my eyes now because I like that. I've 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 never thought about it like, like that, which I think is pretty interesting because I think uh, I think we all put our pants on the same way, no matter who you are. Um, uh, but you said you close your eyes where? And where, where was that in the NFL, or, you, or just? What's I mean, context of it? I mean, when, when, you know, in that in that context, I think a lot of that did start for me at that era in the NFL. You know, okay, okay, a lot of it did. you know, a lot of it did, and and and, and because you got to understand, you you've got to listen. You know, I mean, no matter how smart the coach is, right? And I get it, but at sometimes you telling me to do something that exactly you can't do. You know what I mean? So when I say that, it, it, yeah, you can draw up on the board, you can do all those things. You know, and I, my route is not right. Maybe through the years you saw, you know, other people do it, but at the same time, and I'm not actually at the age of or such, such to go to go do it. But when you're critiquing somebody, you know, I'll, here, here it is. There's nothing like dealing with a person who's been in the trenches that you've been there. You know, and you know, it's, there's nothing like that to me. There's nothing like dealing with that that kind of person who's been in the trenches like you. Now he's leading you. You know. And some of my coaches, they, you know, I tell you, in, in, in college, my last year, he he done it. He was in the trenches. He knew some of, you know, as a leader, he had the he had the right recipe to help lead us to success. You know, so that's kind of yo. When I got to the next level, and you start hearing people talk, you got to just close your eyes and listen to the to to their words. How about yourself, Emily, from a leadership perspective? Man, I do. <laughs> I. I agree with what Tremaine said, like where he learned that kind of in the NFL world, because I'm slowly starting to learn um, that in the elite running community, like somebody gives me their perspective and they might not look like a runner, right? Or they, they just might not look like they know anything about running. Like they just look like a football coach or, you know, just something like that. So I really have to put my my mind to what they're saying versus how they look or what they've done that's really hard for me so like you come to me and you're like all right we're I'm gonna be your coach but I run three hours slower than you then I'm like 
how are you going to help me? Um, so, but I, I hate when people think that way, right? Like when runners think that about like, say me coaching them. So I have to really listen to their knowledge and really listen what they have to bring to me. And then after that, put all their knowledge into my knowledge and figure out, you know, like, is this the right thing? Um, um, for me, do I believe in it? Um, can this help you? Um, but I'm just starting to learn that. So it's taken me a while. Um, college is its own beast on its own in the running community. You kind of are like buying into what your coach is saying. Whereas in the elite field, you have to figure out what is your thing and what is not your thing. So I do agree with Tremaine. How about leaders that, that, uh, that, have, that you admire? Can you name one or two that you admire? Oh, yeah. Um, my college coach, um, God bless his soul. I love him. Um, Bob Lilly was probably the best coach I've ever had. He's the realest coach I've ever had. Like one year I really struggled with eating, lost a lot of weight and he called me out for it. And I don't mean just like called me out like one on one, like we were in a group meeting. Right. And he was like, yeah, some of these runners won't be running at nationals if they don't their act together, like in front of everybody. And he was like, uh, <laughs> Emily, that's you I'm talking about. I was like, whoa, all right. I'm glad we can do that. Um, <laughs> he taught me a lot. He definitely taught me to push myself and you can do anything that you set your mind to. And I admire that because a lot, I had a coach that beat me down pretty bad. And I was like, I hate this. I don't know why I'm going to school for running. Like, I don't even know why I'm here. Um, so he just gave me a lot of joy. Still stays in touch. Just his leadership. Um, he's a believer in God, and he incorporates that into everything we do. And I'm I'm thankful that he crossed paths with me in life. So, how about yourself, Jermaine? A leader you know, that you admire. One of the biggest things, man, was. Uh, I remember my high school coach, Coach Melvin Randall, you know, and uh, I, he was very, very, very honest man. And uh, when I say that, like, even though I was seen to be like the, the all-American kind of kid, and, and, you know, he taught me a lesson by sitting me on the bench. He taught me a lesson. He, he, and his lesson was simply the fact of the matter that anybody can take your spot, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was one of those lessons that, that the e, if I'm talking about today, that it sunk in me. It didn't go out of one ear and out the other. And I got a lot, a lot of respect and because at the, end, at the end of the day, he came back and he did what he did and still showed me love. You know, he taught me a lesson, by, you know, which was hard. It was hard, but I took it with me everywhere, every level that I went to. Like, you're, you're, you're not that good, you know, to the point that nobody can't come in and take your spot, you know? And, 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 and that taking in business as well. So it seems that both of you uh, collectively have had your, uh, your your fair share of experiences uh, from individuals that bad coaching, good coaching, bad leaders, great leaders. And uh, how you how are you pretty much taking all those four approaches and pretty much turning not just athletes, but individuals that are also great leaders going forward uh, through the enhance you. Well, you know, I know that, uh, you know, I know Emily's going to be awesome, man. She, she really she has just joined us. But it's like, you know, when I watch her with the young kids and the youth, you know, she does an awesome job. And as you can hear from our conversation, you know, just she's, she's been through that, you know, good, bad coaches, you know, some, some misfortune, you know, bad people who have bad, bad character and all those things, you know, and their integrity is not right. But, you know, now we know we take that 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 pot and you you know you bring it in and you, know, you understand to the point of like hey I don't want to be like such and so that was coaching me mm. or better yet I want to take some a bit of the Melvin Coach Randall's approach that yeah, you know I gotta some way let this kid know that hey you are a five star athlete but hey you can still fall off the wagon you know so uh, that is truly our approach to all those those things and again. And this question, it's a wonderful question because there's nothing like life experiences to build a program around. And, and that, has, that has been the biggest thing for us 
we take the life experiences that we dealt with, with good and bad, and we put it into that, that formula. And we that's why we made it better athletes, better people. Because as coaches and trainers, we know that we got to make that connection. And the only way you make that connection is being honest with the athlete. And sometimes we, that is the hardest thing to do. That is the hardest thing to do. Because somebody has patted them on the back enough to the point they told them they, they're all American and they can't even uh, you know, do a karaoke. You get what I'm saying? I'm just, yeah, yeah, you know, that, yeah. that simple. You got to have, and now with us and who we are, we got to be honest. We got to be honest. I don't want to be like the the, the, the the people down the street and say, oh, oh yeah, oh, he's right there. Or, or, or she's going to, she's, she, she's pretty good. No, 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 no. They have a lot to work on. So you know? pretty much, you pretty much break. Sorry, so you pretty much break them down to build them back up. That's it. That's it. Yep. That's it. That's it. You know, and, you, and when, when you and when you're doing that, and 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 you know, be honest. I think that's the military style. You know, I think that's when you come. I think that's the military style. And I, and, and I say we're uh, you know military minded people, but you know, <laughs> from the sports performance arena, yeah, because you're coming in as a novice. Yo, you know, you're coming as better. There's always somebody that's better yes. than you, no matter what sport it is, right? So if you come in with that with that mentality, like you said, right? We, I'm I'm good. I've yes. been good. I'm been great. There's always somebody else that, that could take your spot, like you mentioned. That's it. That's it. Um, how about how about uh, let's talk about Cologne? I see that you you also been to Cologne uh, in Germany, correct? Yeah, I was. Uh huh. How, how how was that experience in Cologne? Uh, I mean, that was that was phenomenal. <laughs> and, I'm on and to you know to see something different yeah. like, like that uh, it just you know it opened my eyes a whole lot here in, in, in to, to the point of where where you could go you know and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to God for that great experience and you know those you know you they, the culture showed me for one, number one that eating different does an amazing job for your body you know what I mean <laughs> so, <laughs> you know they, I mean, their, I mean, their food was, you know, I mean, it was good, but it was, you could tell that it, they, they cared about what they put in their bodies, you know, and not to say that we don't care in the USA. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that, but it was a different, different feel about, you know, when they brought a plate to your table, you know, you could tell like this was like care for a whole lot yeah, from the yeah. big restaurant to the mom and pop situation, you know, yeah. fresh and green, all those things. And it wasn't a lot. It wasn't a lot. I really had to adjust that because, you know, I was used to having spaghetti like five times over, you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> so I really had to adjust to that, man. And, and uh, it was in Cologne, Germany. I learned to drink water with no ice. You know, I learned to, you know, to do, do, to do those things and take that appreciation in life. Like, man, like, hey, you know, hey, you know tell you what, man, this is, this is different, but it's teaching me. So I really enjoyed it. So it's kind of like what you mentioned, right? Those those life experiences, and I'm I'm, uh, I'm I'm assuming that being there in Cologne kind of helped you shape you into who you are right now, uh, and also probably helped you out. Now, was that before uh, the the Titans or or before the the Saints that you went to Cologne? That was doing the Titans. Yeah. So doing so. I, so how how did that how did that work when you were in the Titans? Was that some that was that something that you decided to do on your own? Or was that a, a program that you saw that you could have just jumped on for uh, for self development? Self development coming in there, and uh, it was just the, the the opportunity that they sent you over there too, you know, to get developed. You know, so mm. you know because I, you picked up the game a little bit once you got to the speed of it, but it, it was something that you had to go over and learn even more, you know, at the next level. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, now, how but about it, it the was, end? Uh, was that? It was wild over there, you know. You learned you got traded to the New Orleans Saints, you know. <laughs> so you were you were not expecting that either, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> so when you got that call, what we do? You remember what you were doing in in, uh, in Germany when you got that call to to go to uh, to Louisiana? Man, so well, really, it was we were on our way back, you know. So I was on back. I was like, I'm getting ready to go back to Nashville, pick my car up. You know what I mean? Get get back to the place, you know. And uh, your agent called. It was like 
it was between the Jets and uh, New Orleans, you know, no shit. that you get traded to. And then the Falcons, the Falcons called too. So they, they were going to three-rate trade, like, you know, and I guess with me being like say seven rounder, seven rounder, I guess you you had to pay out my my pay off my uh contract thing. Yep. And and New Orleans did. So so you had no idea that was happening. You then it's just like another no. <laughs> another no. just, another change in, in your life. Um mm -hmm. so how so this is a, I think a no brainer, but how did your experience at the, in the playing in the NFL kind of help you with enhance you right now because i know that's definitely uh from my opinion when you have uh the program that you have in your your background that may help draw clients in or draw people in but what what are the things that people don't know from you that helped you to be the the, the coach that you are right now and the trainer that you are based on those experiences for instance i mean it's one of those things it uh it lets me know that you know through all do all of it you know you look at it as is uh, you've been there before, you know. Back to you've the been trenches, there before. Right? That's kinda, yep, that it, it, it just translates every single time. You've been there before, and you know the grit and the hard work and 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 and, and, the, and the intensity that has to be applied to the kid who says, "I want to be a Division One athlete, whether a runner, anything else." He or she un has to have to understand what it's going to take. And a lot of times you have to implement that same uh, approach to the parent, you know, because you can't come and spend two hundred and fifty dollars with us for one month and think, oh, it's going to be, you know, your kid's going to the next level. No, <laughs> that's not. That's not, That's you know, that's that's not how it works. But the thing about it is this: it's like if you're willing to really invest over time into to this to your athlete, then you will see those changes. You know, the commitment to it and the commitment of being successful. So in this, in the business and where we run it, our, the facility and training, the, the commitment has helped me so much to the point when I don't want to get up and do the business stuff part of it, I got to remember the commitment to it. You know, the commitment that helped, helped me go to the next level every single, every single time in my career. How much I, I you know, I ran when I didn't want to run, you know? Yeah, but I wanted something out of it. So, so as you as you were uh, saying that, one thing that came to mind was dividends, right? Because you can't just yeah. an anticipate being two fifty now and then tomorrow you're gonna be like a, a superstar, right. right? JJ Watts or whatnot, <laughs> or Braxton right. Miller, like or Braxton Miller, like you said, right? It pretty much just right. you have to keep on chipping away slowly and slowly, and then all of a sudden, boom! Uh, intensity. I wanna I wanna uh, piggyback off of that word intensity. How about you, Emily, in track and field? Uh, I know that I've seen that you, you ran before in Carlisle High School um, in, in multiple different races. Uh, what, what's your approach to uh, or approach or philosophy to, to the intensity that's needed to be a good coach uh, and, and trainer? Ooh, I, uh, well, the intensity to be a coach and a trainer um, in your role, like for me or for just running? Uh, both. Uh, both. <laughs> Well, um, the, the intensity for me is I love it and I want to see people succeed. Like I'm hungry for them to succeed, not for me to succeed. Like I just love seeing people reach their goals. Like I had a kid, um, qualify for junior, um, junior high nationals. They don't call it nationals. They call it like league. Um, and then they get a state. But I literally cried in front of everybody because I was so happy for this kid. So it just brings me so much joy because I did have a coach like that. And he followed me all the way through college, um, my whole running career. And I love that. That's like one thing I took. And it like hungers me to see other people do really good. Um, as an athlete, I'm always hungry. Like I, I want to do bigger and better things all the time, right? Who doesn't want to? Um but you have to really take care of yourself, right? So you have to invest a lot of time um, running. Like every other sport takes so much time out of your day. You have to prep, make sure you're eating right, make sure you're stretching. People hate stretching. I hate stretching. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think runners, runners in general, I mean, any anybody hates uh, stretching. But I know one thing for sure, because I, 
Uh, like I mentioned before, I like to run a lot. I know runners hate it. <laughs> um, it's like an extra like 10 minutes to your day where you could just be running. So like, why? But it's what, so what? important. <laughs> so for you in, in 10 minutes, what, what you're covering like two miles in 10 minutes? <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your experiences with running, wh what have they? I know you've done, uh, uh, what was it, 1,600 meters, uh, 400s, uh, 800s, 1,600s, like I mentioned. How about marathons? Have you done any of those? Okay. Yeah. Um, I am all over the place when it comes to running. <laughs> I'm like, I'm a runner <laughs> And I'm a middle distance runner. They technically think that the mile is middle distance. I don't really know who put that in the books, but I don't think the mile is just middle distance race. But um, I ran in college the 400, 600, 800, the 1K, and then the 15 and 1600. Um, and I loved them. Don't get me wrong. Um, ran all of those in high school. Yeah, in high school, they thought I was going to be a distance runner, put me in the two mile, and I hated it. I never thought in my life I would ever be a distance runner. Um, and so I just mainly stuck to 100 in the 1600 meters um, in high school. And when I went to college, my coach was like, no, you're running cross country. Like, it will be good for you. And I was like, I think he's insane. Um, <laughs> hated it. Like, freshman year hated running please do not look up those stats they were terrible my freshman year hated cross country um <laughs> it's it taught me a lot about myself and I might have sucked at cross country my freshman year but it taught me so much about myself and who I am as an individual that I gained a love for it and after college I started running miles and miles a day like 15 miles here 16 miles here um and I was like let's do a marathon so I did um and I just love it I have like a burn for running like I just want to do it I want to go as far as I can go but I'm not like you I'm not an ultra runner I'm just a road runner so <laughs> um <laughs> but I did last city and then my next one um was supposed to be in Indianapolis I actually got really sick and all only did the half um there and I did pretty well I got a PR um I ran a marathon before I ran a half marathon though so I went backwards like versus what you did <laughs> and, um Boston was supposed to be my next marathon so yeah okay so Boston was supposed to be your your, your next one um I heard that it may have been pushed back <laughs> that sucks I, yeah I, I know because of the pandemic it's, it's, it's been pushed back but how did that mess with your training? I know you're you're pumped up, you're getting ready to do it, and that, then it gets pushed back. Yeah, three, I think it was either three or four weeks out that they told us, hey, we're canceling it. Um, I have been working since my last marathon to really just become a quicker marathon runner. Um, my first one, I'm just going to be real. I just ran mileage all the time. I didn't know speed work. Um, it was by the grace of God that I qualified for Boston. And then, um, you know, like you go through a whole summer and fall of just whipping out all these quick miles, whipping out all these hard workouts. And they tell you that and you're just kind of devastated, right? So you peak and now you're like, what do I do with myself? Do I like mentally try to run 26 miles by myself? Or do I take a few weeks off or back off a little? Um, I love running so much that it's very hard for me to quit running even when I need to. So I took two weeks to cross train. I bought an elliptical. It's in my apartment. My neighbors probably hate me. <laughs> um, and... <laughs> I did my elliptical and I ran here and there. Um, I'm back to training. Um, am I going to train as hard as I would normally for a marathon for September? I really don't know. Everybody keeps asking me that. I was in the best shape of my running career. So I don't know if I can get back to that. And I don't know if I should, like if I mentally 
if they cancel it, I don't know if I mentally can handle it again. <laughs> what 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 has been your longest uh, distance run thus far? Um, for, tra- for training, for training, twenty seven for training. Um, twenty miles. I did that three or four times. I want to say just three though. Yeah. Okay, so your longest has been twenty seven. For training, has been twenty. Um, yes. Okay. And how come, if, if I could ask, how come stopping at 20? Um, well, a lot of times we look, I lied. Actually, I did go 22 um, during the summer, but that was a special occasion. Uh, we were just trying to push my limits. Um, but, you know, we only run our marathon in a certain time, right? So why am I going to go on a training run that's going to take me either the same amount of time that I'm going to race in or longer? So um, a lot of reading that I have done with marathons is you should only do one, but depending on your level, you should only do one to three runs that are a little over two hours or like closer to that three hour marker, but you don't want to go over that. We're already trained to do the marathon once we're peaking at 20 miles. So um, definitely, um, I mean, I hate to say it's just six more miles, right? Because it's not just six more miles. Like the six miles are probably the roughest six miles you have in your race. <laughs> I, I, would, um, I would, I would, I would, have you been to Boston yet? Um, no, I uh, virtually saw it multiple times. <laughs> so, uh, so let me pick it back off of what you said, those six miles, for example, I think those 0.2 miles, when you turn that last corner, so the way that Boston, because I've done Boston twice, the way that Boston works is that once you get to 26, they, pretty much the crowd is just there pumping you up, right? You're just dra- you're just basically just exhausted, but they're pumping you up. And when you turn that corner and you just start seeing the, the finish line, it seems far as hell, but it's 0.2, 0.2 miles, right? So the reason why I'm asking yeah. is it's like what you said, six miles, is, it's, 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 it's an eternity after you've done 20. But even point yeah. two after you've done twenty six, it's even longer. But the but the great thing about Boston is that once you get to that twenty six, you're guaranteed to cross that line because it's just like the energy that's there, people are there. You you're mentally prepared to get there, right? So I wish you the best. I definitely wish you the best for sure. <laughs> Thank you. So mental and physical preparedness. Uh, obviously, uh, we train as athletes physically, but mental. Right. Is there a place for, for mental preparedness in, in the world of, of athletes? Oh, yes, um, definitely. Um, growing up, I'm a very mental runner. I'm sure you know all about mental running. Like you're either in it or you're not in it. You're hot or cold. I think that goes with any sport, right? Like if you walk onto that court and you're just not feeling it that day, where's the mentality right like are you physically ready for that big game um I I have to go to the course and visually see myself running Hmm. it which is really weird to say or like it's actually important it (laughs) is and you should like envision so like for a marathon I had to like envision, okay, at this mile, I'm going to take my goo and then get my water, or I'm going to already have my goo open and ready. Um, You're mentally preparing yourself, right? Like, but you also have to make sure that you think of everything, right? So if I'm not ready by this point, you shouldn't freak out. Like you'll get there. Or what if this happens? Okay, well that happened. Now we got up for it somewhere. So I think that's, um a big key in sports because we plan for perfect right and then when perfect doesn't happen that kills us mentally so we always have to have a plan a b and c i think so <laughs> yeah that's true <laughs> so it seems uh I'm, I'm chuckling because it seems like you're speaking like an ultra marathon runner at some point i, I see you <laughs> <laughs> i hope not i hope that's not the case <laughs> <laughs> no I, I listen uh one thing that i uh uh from personal experience, one thing that for sure in the ultra marathon world is that you're there a lot of times by yourself, meaning that you could be, you know, at mile 50 and then the next rest stop is going to be mile 60 or, or mile 55. 
and after 50 after 50 plus miles your body is just worn out right so you have to go that extra five miles to get to that to that uh to that uh stops uh where pretty much your bag is with all your all your necessities or the rest stop where the uh the food is and, and water and help and people that some of that some of you can actually touch and talk to um and there's a lot of preparedness that has to go into that. And I mentioned that because you could step into the, like you said, you could go into game day and not mentally put yourself in, in into that into that court. But if you don't prepare adequately or just don't have a plan A, B, C of the contingency plans, you're just not going to be performing very well. Or you may just, you, you people can see it. People can see whether if you're a pro athlete or not, people can see whether or not you were, you were ready. So I'm glad you said, you know, that mental preparedness is definitely definitely needed so is there anything else that you yeah. would like to share with people that uh from a running perspective that they've been thinking about running they put into their new year's resolution and now that we're in, uh in in the in the pandemic they, they keep on saying yeah i'm gonna go running but they still are what, what would be some some tips or guidelines that, that you could leave people with for running uh just go for it put lace up your shoes Go for 10 minutes, see how you feel. Do not overdo it. I have so many friends that have texted me and been like, whoa, I overdid it today. Just <laughs> do it. Whatever, like whatever your, there are so many reasons just to be outside right now during COVID-19. And the, my biggest thing is seeing people bettering themselves and making themselves healthier. Um, up in 2017, I broke my back in a car accident and I thought I would never lace my shoes up and run again. And I, it mentally made me one, a better human, but it made me realize that we take advantage of using our whole body or using our legs and running is something that is not, it's not anybody can do it and they can enjoy it right it's the best stress reliever I've ever had like I just lace them up I go out for it it makes me happy and people think that you have to run forever no running could be like five minutes or ten yes, minutes or definitely you know like so just go and do it and have fun um I have some younger athletes that do not have fun running they do it because they're competitive and hungry um but when I broke my back, I realized that was me. That was totally me. I was only there because I wanted to be the best of the best. And when I broke my back, that put a whole new spin on things. Like, you do not need to be the best of the best. You're, you should do it because you love it. Um, and stay committed. I mean, we form habits in 21 days, right? So if you do it for 21 days or you walking and running, walk and run, jog and run, um, you're going to enjoy it and you're going to continue to do it. It's not running. Isn't one of those things where you just drop, drop off the face of the earth. Like once you love it, you're kind of stuck with it, even when you hate it. So <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely true. So have fun. There's definitely a balance. You have, they have to be, uh, because you don't want to, you don't want to be burnt out, right? If you're not having fun, forget about it. You're just not going to be motivated or inspired yeah. to, to go back out. But 21 days, you said it, it, it takes 21 days to create a habit. So that's awesome. And then stay committed as well. So, um, well, yeah. Emily, thank, thank you so much for, for joining me today on, on, on the podcast. I know Trayvon had to go and train somebody, which is, uh, uh, you know, why he's not here right now, but I really, really do appreciate it. Um, and with that, please, my friend, take care and be safe. You too. Right. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>